this. All right, Ed, it's all you. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, not can't see how many people have joined the call yet, but I'm going to get started because I got a lot of material to cover, and if people join late, uh, that's fine. Um, I I don't mind being interrupted with questions, um, but I'm going to try to leave time at the end, so don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, but I will. I'm going to try to move through this. I got a lot of material. I'm going to try to move through somewhat quickly, uh, so we can have questions at the end. But my name is Ed McDonald. Uh, I'm a senior software developer at Solution Street, uh, and I'm presenting on my Docker and Kubernetes sandbox. So let's jump right in. First of all, uh, let's talk about why do you need a sandbox? Um, so these are all rhetorical questions asking all the people on the call, so it's just something to think about. Uh, but right now, just try to think to yourself, how many versions of Python or Java or Ruby or Perl or Node uh, are on your machine right now, uh, and where are they installed? Uh, another question, if you got a new machine today, how long would it take until all of your existing projects built on it? Uh, is there any software on your machine that you downloaded once and forgot about? Um, that's kind of a hard question to answer because if you've forgotten about it, you don't know it's there, but do you think that this is happening on your machine right now? Uh, finally, do you love experimenting with new technology? Uh, and just an FYI real quick, and I'll talk about this in the demo, but Everything you're seeing right now uh, is running from my sandbox. In fact, when I uh, pop this window open, this will be the only window down here at the bottom, the one with the big red bar. That's the only one that's not running inside the sandbox. This terminal and uh, the presentation you're watching are all running in the sandbox. Okay, so what drove me to make this particular sandbox? So how did this come about? Uh, well. When I mess around with new software, it's not always clear to me that my first attempt at installing it is going to be my best attempt. Uh, this sandbox started, um, I started a book club with a few friends uh, to read Paul Graham's On List book. And so this development environment started as a development environment using SBCL, Steel Bank Common List, and SpaceBax, so that I had something to give to my friends if they didn't want to bother installing uh, SBCL and SpaceBax, which is kind of a pain. Um, from there though, it quickly evolved into a Kubernetes playground, uh, something which is somewhat daunting to configure. Uh, and just when I'm, the big reason that drove me to make this sandbox is if I know I can clean something up easily, I'm more inclined to install and try it out. So one of my biggest issues is I have a Mac uh, and I use Time Machine. So my current Mac, although it's the third or fourth incarnation of it, is essentially the same Mac in terms of file system that I bought 15 or 20 years ago. So I'm very conscious about installing stuff that I know that I'm going to have trouble cleaning up later. Um, another example is I installed Minikube once directly onto my host and I'm still not sure that everything has been removed. Finally, cleaning up this sandbox is easy as just running Docker kill, whatever container it creates and then removing the image. That's it, the whole thing's cleaned up. So quickly, I want to do a quick demo to break up the slides a bit. So like I said, here I'm running inside of the sandbox. Uh, there is the Docker container that's running the sandbox. And actually, bear with me one second here. Well, uh, someone speak up if they're really having trouble seeing that. I'm inclined not to increase the font because it's gonna make other parts of the demo harder, but um, this is just to show you that the image that's running this is a 43 gigabyte image. I've, I've got tons of stuff installed, um, but we can use some better tools to poke around here. This is installed in the image. So this is a curses based GUI for looking at Docker containers. Here you'll see the container. Uh, this is just a name that um, Docker chose. This is the random name it chooses. And if I look around here, we can see Yeah, we can see some usage. Uh, what I really want to show you here is these are all the processes that are currently running in the container. So when I told you that this presentation is running in the container, that's what this PIM press is. Uh, here you see lazy Docker, the command we just started, which is what we're in right now. Um, we also see supervisor D, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. And that's it for now. Oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for, the terminal, which is what this program is running in. Uh, we can get a little bit more interesting. 
uh, and start GUI applications. So this is the program I use to uh, let me get this real quick. Projects on this book club presentations. So when I say that we're in the uh, sandbox right now, not only am I presenting from the sandbox, but I use this sandbox to build the entire presentation. So this, this will look more familiar in a second as we start going through the presentation, showing some graphics. So that's the quick first demo. Okay, so now I need to talk about Docker a little bit. Um, but first, before I do that, I wanna ask, what is Linux? So a lot of people are familiar with Linux. Um, these are again, rhetorical questions. Is Red Hat Linux? Is Ubuntu Linux? Is Debian Linux? Is Alpine Linux? The answer to all those may surprise you is no. Uh, so what is it? Linux is a kernel, uh, and a kernel is a set of system calls providing a hardware abstraction. And this is really important. The Linux community, the maintainers, Linus Torvalds especially, feels very, very strongly about keeping system calls backwards compatible. Now back uh, to the sandbox. Why does this matter? Well. Docker images, um, when people talk about Docker being a more lightweight virtualization than a virtual machine, uh, one of the big reasons for that is that uh, Docker containers don't have their own kernel. Uh, all a Docker container is, is a file system with some binaries uh, and some Docker provides some abstractions giving it its own network stack, stuff like that. Um, but this is really important. You can reasonably expect a Docker image based on an old kernel to run on a newer one. A lot of people don't even think about that, but that's what's going on under the covers. I wouldn't expect, you should not expect a Docker image built against a newer kernel to run on an older one. Shouldn't expect it. It often works because they seldom add system calls, but that's what would break it, is if they added a new system call and you tried to run it on an older kernel. Um, but this is what makes it a great platform for a sandbox. You essentially lump all of your software and its configuration in a container. Again, that's a software and configuration. All that is is files on a file system. And you can reasonably expect it to remain portable to continue working. So you can kind of choose when you upgrade it. You don't have to be forced to upgrade it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, my sandbox and how I built it. You're good with quotes. I'll look for a slide real quick. I'm sorry, was that a question? Oh, guess not. Okay. Um, so I started with Windows. I'm going to talk about why I did that in a second. Then I installed an X server. Now, already we're going off script a little bit. So, what is an X server? I was brought to my attention that uh, a lot of people may not be familiar with that. So, an X what? An X server. Uh, once upon a time, uh, kernels and windowing systems were developed completely independently of each other. This is surprising to people who have used Windows and Mac OS all their lives. Uh, they tend to think of them as the same thing. Uh, but when you write a program uh, that needs to draw windows to, on a display, which when we talk in the language of X servers, uh, we call that an X client, uh, and they just send instructions to an X server. This is how Linux works. This is how Linux always worked. There's a new product called, or new project called Wayland that uh, it differs from an X server. You can Google the details on that. But for our conversation, we're only going to be considering X servers. Um, and then what the server does is it sends things like mouse events back to the clients. So there's a conversation. There's two pieces of software. Your X client uh, that needs to draw windows to a screen, it doesn't do that itself. It just sends messages to an X server. Um, so WSL uh, doesn't have access to display. That's Windows responsibility. We're gonna get to WSL in a second, but what WSL is is the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, I think if that wasn't on the last slide, it'll be on the next one. So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so we install an X server that runs on Windows and have WSL and by extension Docker send window drawing requests to it. That's gonna make more sense in a second. So here we are back to Windows in our X server. As I mentioned, the next piece to my uh, sandbox is WSL. So this is this is all stuff I've installed before Docker. So Windows uh, X server, the X server, and there's a link to it in the end of the slides is VCX SRV, which is an open source X server for Windows. Uh, then I installed WSL. Uh, there is uh, there was a link in the footnote on the previous slide, and I'll make these slides available. Um, it is extremely useful. It is a uh, it's basically Linux running inside of Windows, and it is 
indistinguishable from actual Linux because it is real Linux. Um, can't promote it enough. <clears throat> so uh, inside of WSL, uh, this starting to look like Unix. Notice I'm using Unix paths here. I have a user ID and a home directory. Um, this WSL user maps back onto a Windows user. That's some Windows magic I don't understand. Um, why this is important, we'll get to that in a second. Then I install, so people who are familiar with Docker um, may know that there is a Docker daemon and a Docker CLI that talks to the Docker daemon. I installed, installed the Docker CLI in WSL. And then I also installed the Docker daemon uh, in WSL. Uh, and I use the Linux packages to do so. In other words, I'm not running Docker desktop on Windows. Um, if you install Docker Desktop, I think this still works. I ran into some problems with it early, but I think that I had to fix those same problems in my current setup. So, uh, but but I, I'm not using Docker Desktop. I think you can use Docker Desktop because you can tell Docker Desktop to use the uh, WSL drivers under the covers. WSL is what is important here. Okay, now I promised I would talk about why I chose Windows for this. So, uh, first, right off the bat, if you're going to set up this uh, uh, a sandbox similar to what I'm doing and you're using Docker to do it, Linux is clearly the best choice. Um, in other words, don't, don't use Windows, just use Linux. Uh, in fact, I started all of this on my Linux workstation, but then the problem is, is I ran out of cores. So that's when I moved to Windows. Uh, why Windows? Uh, because like most PC gamers, um, my Windows PC happens to be the most powerful machine in my house. So, and it had Windows on it. I wasn't gonna do a dual boot Linux. So I decided to try if, to see if I could get this working on Windows under WSL. Uh, it's the only reason I'm using Windows. Um, but it turned out to be surprisingly great. I mean, I'm not a Windows fan other than playing games, uh, but this sandbox works incredibly well on Windows. Uh, as I mentioned before, WSL is very nice. If you don't know what it is, look it up, find out how to install it. Uh, you will find yourself using sadly, Mac and Linux less because you can run Linux on your Windows machine and it is very good. Um, so WSL appears, this is just based on my experiments, it appears to share all resources, uh, CPU and memory with Windows, uh, which means that I don't have to make a decision. Like I wanna allocate this much memory to WSL, uh, which means it won't be available to Windows. Uh, and VCX SRV is very capable. This is the X server that I was talking about. I haven't had any problems with it. This stack runs incredibly well on Windows. So my second favorite operating system behind Linux is OS X. Um, it fell on its face here. I, I, it was surprisingly bad because I tried to get this running on Windows and I have a very powerful Mac, I'm sorry, on Mac. I have a very powerful Mac and I had issues. The big issue was Docker desktop on a Mac, I, I'm not saying this is true on Windows because on Windows it runs on WSL. On a Mac, Docker Desktop installs a VM and Docker runs inside of the VM and you have to tell uh, Docker Desktop how much memory on CPU cores to dedicate to the VM. And from my experience, it appears to make those resources unavailable to the host. I'm not 100% sure that that's true, but from my experiments, that's what tends to happen. Uh, and Xquartz is the, if you were to install an X server on Mac, Xquartz is the tool you would use. It is not as nice as uh, VC XSRV, um, at least on Ventura, which is what I'm running on my Mac. I had all kinds of issues with it and couldn't get it to run. So I gave up. Okay, now finally onto the sandbox. So this is the first step. All of this other stuff that's not green on this slide was all this, all the, the pre-work for the baseline. Now um, I'm installing the sandbox. So First, I created a Docker container. This is the one I showed you in the first demo, which is about 48, I think, gigabytes uh, it was. There's a ton of software installed on it. Um, this is just a sampling of the software I installed on it. I have IntelliJ running in it, Java, Firefox, the Docker CLI, and Supervisor D. These last two um, are the most interesting for the sake of, of this demo, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, and then I also, in the Docker container, I create a user and I create a directory and I choose these very carefully so that they match uh, the user and directory on WSL. Get to that in a second, but yes, they're mapped there. Uh, this is also very interesting and this should surprise people who are familiar with Docker. Um, 
I have the Docker CLI talk to the same Docker daemon uh, that the Docker CLI on WSL is talking to. So that, that is why when I showed you the first demo and I was running inside of the container and I ran Docker commands, the container could see itself. That is uh, pretty slick. All right, so now briefly, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail. If Docker and Docker means nothing to you, you can take a nap for these next two slides because I'm not gonna go into any detail here. This is just for the people who know what Docker and Docker means. Uh, I opted not to use Docker and Docker because it's an enormous pain. Um, so how can I get by without using Docker and Docker? Well, if you're inside of a container and the only two things you wanna be able to do are create new containers and share files in your container with these new containers that you've created, you don't need Docker and Docker. You do what I did, you install the Docker CLI in your container, uh, you mount the host Unix domain socket into the container. So the Unix domain socket is what uh, the Docker CLI uses to talk to uh, the Docker daemon if you're on the same host, otherwise it uses TCP. But so this is what allows the Docker client inside the container to talk to the Docker daemon. And then this is the another very important part is you just ensure that for host directories bind mounted into your container, uh, the container and the host use the same name for them. So people who are familiar with the, the Docker syntax, this is all I mean by that. The both sides of the, this is the one on your host, homey McDonald projects on the right, just call it the same thing in your container on the left. Um, then anytime your container refers to files and writes them to the host, both places and any new Docker containers you create will all refer to them as the same thing, which gives you this magic of making it appear as if you're running in Docker inside of Docker when you're really not. And uh, you, I won't have time to demo this, but, but you can just write a startup script that manages all this for you. So I have a startup script that when I start my sandbox, it says, Am I inside of my home directory? If not, fail immediately because I don't know how to bind mount stuff outside of the home directory. There's a whole bunch of magic you can do in the shell script to make sure that you can't shoot yourself in the foot by doing this. All right, second demo. How are we looking at time? All right, we got plenty of time. So, uh, so now that I've talked about, um, remember when I said supervisor control or supervisor D and uh, Docker CLI were the two most interesting things in the container. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So uh, here, if I type alias SC, you'll see all that is is an alias for a command that I don't feel like typing, supervisor CTL and in a configuration file. This is the client that talks to the supervisor CTL daemon. And supervisor D is the... Uh, let me back up a second. When you deploy a Docker container to a Kubernetes uh, or, or to any container orchestration framework, when you're using Docker to deploy your production applications, uh, the, the best practice, and this is certainly good advice to follow, is only one process per container or very few processes per container. Um, However, when you're using it for a sandbox, that is completely useless because I don't want to start, I don't want to create a container for every application uh, that I want to use in my sandbox and then find a way to manage those containers. There are ways to do that. I don't want to do it. So if you want to run multiple processes in a container, uh, you need a, a process manager, something like system D, but supervisor D is, does some of the same tasks as system D, but is much lighter weight. So a very, common or popular uh, pattern to follow when installing multiple processes in a container is to run supervisor D. Uh, and so this just lets me talk to supervisor D and see what processes I have installed. So if I do SC status, these are some, not all, but these are the applications I've installed that need a, a process manager to start up, meaning that they're GUI application. So you've already seen one that I started. I started uh, Dia, but now to show you that I can start others, and we'll use these for the second demo. So here is Firefox uh, running inside of the container. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, here's IntelliJ running inside of the container. 
And when I mentioned earlier that this whole thing all started as a Lisp development environment, oh, LJ is taking over the screen. Here is Emacs running inside of the container. Uh, so we're going to come back to this in a second. Uh, but yes, yeah, so I just want to point out now all of these programs, except this one that I've highlighted at the bottom here, are all running inside of my sandbox, all inside of the container. So if we go back to lazy Docker here, we'll see now that we have a lot more processes running inside of the container. Okay, so now for the really interesting part, um, I mentioned early on in the slides uh, that this kind of evolved into a Kubernetes uh, development framework. So using uh, my, my Docker beside Docker that I talked about here, I, don't, I didn't mention the name, I, I call this Docker beside Docker instead of Docker inside Docker. I'm able to use from inside the container, use this CLI to spawn new containers that live in the same Docker environment as the container that's the sandbox. So for Kubernetes, I start another container and it's running a tool called K3D. Uh, K3D is, uh, now let me start with K3S. So K3S is a lightweight Kubernetes distribution created by the Rancher team that they use internally for development. Uh, and it's, uh, you can Google it. I have a link on the end of the slide. Uh, they removed some things. It's a fully compliant Kubernetes distribution, if I understand correctly, but they've removed some stuff that uh, is enterprisey and not needed if you're running it locally on your machine. So it tends to be a lot faster. Uh, and then they created a project called K3D that runs it inside of a Docker container. Now, uh, I know that other people at Solution Street have used Kind. Uh, I've never used Kind, but I believe it's pretty similar. Um, I would love to talk to some of those people to pick their brains. Um, so yeah, certainly reach out to me. Uh, I just started with K3D and I love it. Um, and I'm curious as to what the differences are between K3D and Kind. Um, my inclination is to want to believe that K3D is lighter weight because it uses K3S. So maybe it has better performance, but I'm, I'm certainly not making that statement because uh, I have not tested it. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna see the Kubernetes cluster. So. going to uh, while we're waiting for this cluster to come up I'll talk a little bit more about this but I provision the cluster so k3d comes with some command line utilities to create a cluster um, the command line utility is called k3d so I wrote a make file that um, uses k3d to provision the cluster and then hands it over to ants I'm sorry uses k3d to create the cluster and then hands it over to ansible to provision the cluster uh, which means k3d uh, the k3d client ansible are all installed within the sandbox um, again so this is all running within the sandbox so when I type make we're going to watch the cluster come up and waiting for one step to happen. Okay. So now, using another tool installed on the sandbox, K9S, which is a uh, Kubernetes. If, if anyone has used the Kubernetes dashboard, K9S is essentially a, uh, I, I say curses. Um, for people who aren't familiar with curses, it's a library that lets you draw windows at the console, so command line or curses based client. Uh, but now we can watch the entire cluster come up. So I've I've installed a bunch of stuff on here, uh, and we'll come back to this. So we see Key Cloak is coming up, we see Prometheus is coming up. Uh, I do have the Kubernetes dashboard installed, but I prefer to use K9S. Uh, Waiting for a couple more interesting things. It's interesting to watch it thrash for a bit. So if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it brings these containers up and then it constantly monitors them and restarts them if they don't come up in time. So you can watch it in real time, um, converging to a steady state. 
All right, this is what I was waiting for. Um, so now I want to show you uh, some of the Ansible stuff we're waiting for it to come up. One thing that I haven't figured out in my sandbox is, so one of the tricks to doing this, when you go through this much trouble to create a sandbox, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about how the software is installed and where it puts its configuration files. I still haven't found where IntelliJ puts its license information. So every time I start it up, I have to come back in and reactivate my license. So that's all we're doing here. So come back here, activate, activate, continue. So when I mentioned, uh, I just want to talk about this briefly. Um, when I mentioned that I use Ansible to provision the cluster, uh, if you're not familiar with Ansible, it is a tool similar to Puppet or Chef that allows you to provision resources, uh, whereas Puppet is more of a pool where you install a daemon on any resource that you want to be provisioned. Ansible is more of a push. Uh, de developers tend to like it more uh, because they have more control. Um, it's more of a push where you specify a configuration and then run Ansible and via SSH, it just runs a whole bunch of commands on a whole bunch of machines and brings them to the state that you want them to be in. I'm actually using a very simple Ansible playbook because the only thing I have it do is install a bunch of Helm charts. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here. The reason that I chose Ansible to do this is because Ansible has a very nice uh, configuration framework where it essentially allows me to specify the configuration for all of my Helm charts uh, in the same directory. So I can come and open this project and look at this directory and I can see how I've configured all of my Helm charts in one place. So on the right hand side now, we're looking at as I open these different config files, uh, I'm just setting different variables. Um, a lot of them have no configuration. This one has some configuration. Uh, Keycloak has a lot of configuration. I'm not going to go into any more detail. Just note that Ansible lets me put all of the configuration for the entire cluster in one place. Now, I think everything except maybe GitLab is coming up. So let me start opening some of these applications uh, in Firefox. And I'm just going to point out that at some point, this may start to slow my machine down, which would be a good time to ask questions. Uh, actually, it's also a good time to show this. So when I said that uh, my Linux workstation ran out of cores, so you can see that my gaming PC that we're using is pretty nicely spec. I have 16 hyper threads which are all right now pretty close to being pegged. Uh, I have 64 gigabytes of memory, which is right now pretty close to being pegged. Um, so if, if you want to do this at home, um, you need, an, if, if you want to install as much stuff as I have installed here, and again, the Kubernetes cluster is, is what's killing this at the moment, um, you might want to get a, a nicely specced machine. Uh, and one of the things I talk about later is, uh, yeah, I'll save it for later, I'll talk about it later. Um, all right, now we're coming up. I want to show Grafana, Kibana. Keycloak. Jenkins and maybe GitLab is finally up by now. Let's see. Yep. I'm just looking over here. So every so this is what the cluster looks like once it's reached its steady state. Everything is running and happy. And GitLab has a certificate that we need to approve. And I just want to move this down a little bit. All right. Log into all of these. And I, I, I don't really have anything to show in Jenkins or GitLab. Uh, but I did want to show off a little bit. We can, yeah, but it's slowing down. 
All right, we'll come back to that. So uh, what I wanted to show you is I just wanted to poke around in Grafana a little bit and maybe Kibana. Um, this has already paid dividends for me. Uh, I used uh, this sandbox to learn a little bit more about Grafana and Kibana, which I use on a daily basis where I work uh, currently for um, Solution Street's customer. Um, anyway, so it's very useful to have. Okay, so now I want to talk about what are the next steps? Like, so I still have ideas for this sandbox. Um, number one, I, I, I briefly mentioned uh, System D and Supervisor D. Uh, I would like to migrate to System D, uh, which, uh, if, if you haven't heard of it, it is a it is a process manager that very controversially most Linux distributions have migrated to to replace the old um, System Five init process. Um, you can Google that. Uh, there's a lot of entertaining reading, a lot of people very angry at each other, um, and it's entertaining arguments to read. But I want to move to Supervisor D, um, which I'm told if you link, uh, if you uh, check out this blog post, uh, the people at Red Hat have claimed that they can run it inside of a container, but not a Docker container, a Podman container, which would also necessitate, I'm sorry, would also necessitate that I move from Docker to Podman, which is something I've also thought about. Uh, I would so you saw that I had GitLab installed in the sandbox. Uh, I would love to self-host this whole thing in GitLab. Uh, right now, I'm I have it all checked into GitHub, which I would uh, maintain so I don't have to do backups. Um, in other words, let uh, GitHub do my backups for me. Uh, but I would like to self-host it in GitLab too. Kind of fork my repository and use the Git uh, use the GitHub as the upstream and just uh, check in and out of GitLab. The other thing I want to do is uh, I've started looking at LDAP servers, which uh, is a convenient way to mock Active Directory. Uh, and so I have this dream of setting up an LDAP server and using it as a source of identity for the key cloak server that you saw running, uh, and then use that to implement SSO across the cluster. And, and what's interesting about this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about packaging this all up, but if you can solve this problem, then all of a sudden you can you could go to an or I mean I don't know how familiar people are with Active Directory but it is I I I don't think I'm making a false statement when I say that it is easily the largest store of enterprise accounts um, in 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 the market so any organization you go to uh, and sign in uh, your account is ultimately probably stored in in Active Directory. Um, and then propagated to things like Okta or Keycloak, for example. So if you can get this working, then you can take this anywhere that has a presumably active directory and sync the accounts. And then all of a sudden you have SSO into this cluster using accounts that already existed, which is a very neat trick, uh, but I don't think it's gonna be easy to solve. Uh, and then I would also like to create some, some uh, Terraform configuration. So right now, the only cluster that this is deployed to is the one running in the sandbox. It would be a neat exercise to create some Terraform to provision AKS, EKS, and GKE, uh, and you can read the footnotes. Those are just the three managed Kubernetes uh, products for the three major clouds, uh, Azure, Elastic, and Google. So I, I would like to be able to consider what it would take to get this to deploy on, um, on those Kubernetes environments. And then what I hinted at before, uh, more cores and more memory. So I went, I mean, I, one of my favorite things to do is, is just go window shopping for new computers uh, online to see how big and expensive I can make them. Uh, it turns out that if you choose uh, the Threadripper CPUs by AMD and choose one with like 128 cores and maybe 256 gigabytes of RAM, um, that gets you into around the ten to twelve thousand dollar workstation range. So, not saying I'm ever going to spend that much money on a workstation, but now I understand some of the workloads uh, that people need those workstations for. Um, this, you know, you, that's what's keeping me from scaling this thing into installing more things on the cluster right now are the number of cores and the amount of memory on my machine. More cores than memory at the moment. Okay, so now even further, some things to think about. Um, so if you're as old as me, I've been doing this, I don't know, for 20 years. Uh, back in the good old days, we used to ship our application code in jars, bars, ears. Uh, obviously I have a Java bias. Um, so if your language of choice has different names for these things, but 
basically you, you packaged up your application code into a deliverable and handed it off to the operations department and said, deploy this, it's your problem now. But then we started moving to containers. So uh, the operations department pushed back and said that uh, you're making this too much of a pain for us. And we said, all right, fine, we'll try to fix it. So we started shipping containers, which contain application code, runtimes, application servers, and all the dependencies. And then we sent the container over the wall, or if you're in a DevOps environment, you assumed responsibility for the container yourself and you deployed it to the cluster. But now, um, you've seen that the sandbox is all encapsulated in the Docker container, and you've seen that I can provision um, full CI CD pipelines. I don't have, I mean, I have the tools to do so. Uh, I have GitLab running. I don't have a pipeline yet, but that's, that's the next logical step. So the question is, what's preventing us from, from wrapping that up in our product and just shipping that as part of it? So use CI CD pipelines and integrated identity provider. If we can get the integration working with LDAP and therefore Active Directory, we have a story to tell, like we can easily integrate our system with your existing user account, just a few configuration files and you're done. Uh, and obviously the thing that started all of this was a, a whole entire development environment that lets us build uh, on top of this. So yeah, what's preventing us from shipping all of that with our software? Okay, uh, that's it for the presentation. I just wanna mention some tools I used. Um, I add these two bullets to every presentation I present because these are two of my favorite tools for making presentations, LitTech and Beamer. Uh, click the links, read about them, they're fantastic. Pimpress is a new tool I discovered for this presentation. Um, Turns out that in Beamer, when you create slides, you can create slides that are double wide where one side has notes, pre presenter notes, and the other side has just a presentation. Pimpress lets you view those two halves on different monitors. So right now I'm looking at two monitors. You see what I'm presenting on one. On the other monitor, I see the previous slide, the next slide, and presentation notes. Um, and then the color palette for the, not, not this color palette, this is the Solution Street colors, but the color palette I used to create the diagrams was uh, a, a nice color palette I found online, uh, just giving them some credit here. Uh, and then everything else, I mentioned VC XSRV, uh, that's an open source uh, Windows X server, it's hosted on SourceForge. Uh, Supervisor D, K3D, Lazy Docker, k I mentioned all of those. SpaceMax is an Emacs distribution uh, that I prefer because it is VI key binding focused. Um, but when I when I start up Emacs, this is you'll see it here. It's actually SpaceMax. Um, it requires Emacs being installed. It's 99% Emacs and then a 1% SpaceMax configuration. But it makes Emacs. Uh, this is a controversial statement. In my opinion, it makes Emacs usable. Um, a lot of people would disagree with that. So finally, that's it for me. Um, I actually have more to demo, but it looks like we are, eh, we're at 40 minutes, so that's a pretty good time. So I will open the floor to questions if people have them. I'll start, what are you thinking? Hey, Ed, this is Joel. Hey, Joel. Um, from, a, uh, my, from a selfish perspective, I'm most interested in the use of this as a, the sort of developer sandbox, a way to sort of quickly spin up a new developer on a project and give them a, everything they need quickly without having to go through, you know, whatever install list. Yep. Uh, how, how is the performance on a Mac of running an IDE in the sandbox compared to native? Is it, you can't tell, is it still laggy and repainty and slow, kind of like the olden days when you would do it? when you're That's, announcing an X window from an X from a Linux server? So I didn't get that far on my Mac because I was so frustrated with X quartz um, because X quartz was doing stuff where it wasn't. So let me uh, actually let me show IntelliJ. So this is doing exactly what you're asking, except it's in Windows, obviously. And you're, there, there's like no artifacts here when I drag it around the scene. I've accidentally, I have multiple desktops. I think I accidentally drag it to a new desktop. Where did it go? But um, so yeah, you're seeing, oh, it's, it's actually on my screen, it's moving very quickly uh, on Zoom, it, it moves slow, but that's an artifact of, of Zoom and the network connection. Um, in here, the, the cursor is very responsive. Uh, it, it runs indistinguishable, indistinguishable from native uh, in Windows. In fact, it even uses the Windows, this even looks like a Windows application because it has like the Windows close buttons at the top. Um, gotcha. On Linux, okay. it, 
on Linux, it basically is native because Docker processes live right next to other processes on the host. On a Mac, um, you're running inside of the virtual machine, so it's a little bit harder to tell that Mac is the worst of the three. I, I still gotcha. think it's pretty good if you can get it to work, but. Okay, then my second question, um, if you're like me and you just use an editor and you don't use an IDE, can I set up my sandbox to have like all the stuff I need to run my app server and my database, everything, and then I can just mount like Visual Studio Code from the host OS into the sandbox. Is that is that doable? Yeah, um, I'm 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 doing that in reverse. So all of this, uh, all of these files are actually on my host. So I'm opening. So the mount that, that you are asking about exists. It's just two ways, and I'm using it in the other direction. I'm using it inside the container to modify the files on my host. You can you can do it in the other direction too. Gotcha. Oh, very cool. Yep. Great. And then do we have to pay for any of this software or is it all free as in free is, beer? This is all free as in free beer and most of it, uh, that's not true. I, I pay for an IntelliJ license. Um, that's that's the only thing here that is paid for. You could use the community edition of IntelliJ. And, um, but I had heard of something a while back that Docker was going to start charging us. Are you not using like officially Docker? Yeah, so... Docker that, containers, but something else? That's a great question. So Docker uh, is open source. The product they charge for is the Docker desktop, which I'm actually not using. Gotcha. So yeah, so when I start up Docker, so remember when I said these, when, of all of these windows, this is the only one that's actually running on Windows. Um, and this is WSL. So I, uh, I went to the Docker website and they make these harder to find now because they want you to use Docker desktop to charge for it, which I, I don't begrudge them that choice by the way, but um, they make it harder to find, but, but they actually maintain their own uh, apt repository for Ubuntu. And so I just installed Docker via that app repository. So I started from the command line. So this is the Docker daemon output. Um, but yeah, I'm not running Docker desktop. I'm just running, I installed it into the Ubuntu WSL instance and just started from there. Very cool. Anybody else in the room have a question for Ed? Anyone online? Well, thank you, Ed. That was awesome. It was really cool. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Um, can, uh, do we have a place where we can make the slides available? Because they're just PDFs. I can, if, if anyone found the links interesting, and certainly anyone reach out to me with questions. Um, this is, I mean, I don't mind. I didn't put the repository where all this lives um, because I didn't know if we were going to publish this online, and I don't want to end up maintaining it. But but certainly anyone that works at Solution Street, I'm happy.